Well, welcome everybody to Conversations on Critical Operations, or Radio Pi as we call it on our podcast. Uh, today we're going to be meeting with Glenn Milne. He's a production systems manager at Spirit Energy. Hello, Glenn. Hi, Nick. Thank you very much for having me on. Hey, thanks. Thanks for joining us. And our co-host today is Russell Herbert. He's our industry principal for oil and gas here at OSI Soft. Good morning, Russell. Good morning, Nick. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to this uh, Radio Pi session. Great, great. Well, thanks for coming. And uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, uh, Glenn, can you go ahead and describe Spirit Energy and your role there? Yeah, so Spirit Energy, we are, we are one of Europe's top independent exploration and production companies. We've got a team of around 700 people who are overseeing production of around 42 million barrels of oil equivalent uh, per year. Um, our real focus is on maximizing the potential of our assets uh, through thinking differently and acting quickly and doing it safely. And that really is a quote from our CEO. And I think uh, our journey over the past few years really reflects that, you know, thinking differently, acting quickly. Okay. So my role itself as production assistance manager, uh, using that uh, in-depth professional knowledge uh, to help with the strate strategic sorry, selection, development and deployment of systems to support our production operations and help achieve that 42 million uh, barrel target. Okay. You presented uh, a couple of times now on an initiative you started in uh, 2017. Uh, can you go ahead and describe kind of what your issues were in making better use of your sensor-based data? Yeah, I think um, I, I arrived uh, uh, at Centric as it was back then, 2017, uh, and one of my uh, key tasks when I f first arrived was reviewing our pie landscape, and really was a push for my boss to, to make things better. I saw a few problems I'd seen elsewhere, and for the first time, really, I think for me, I had a real chance to make a change. In fact, I've been really fortunate uh, to have some great managers uh, uh, at Spirit and Seneca who've understood the issues and allowed me to, to make the changes we needed. So I think those problems were those I've heard, uh, again, I've experienced elsewhere and I've heard others say that they would experienced in other companies. And it's things like l low user base. There's a tool there that people weren't using it in the day to day. And one of the other issues was low business visibility and uh, of real time data usage and what it could be used for. And another one for me was um, reverting to Excel. We were really good at pulling data from a real time data system, which in this case was Pi, pulling into Excel and manipulating the data in there. And then I think from there you have that siloed approach to, to working. You know, you know, engineer one has one view of a certain problem. Engineer two may have a, a separate view of a problem. Whereas if we had that consistent view, which you know, likes a Pi Vision or any other real time data historian uh, it can provide, you, you sort of remove those silos. But those really were the, the key issues that I uh, I saw when I when I first arrived. So um, how did you go about um, doing it? Can you describe that? Yeah, so I think for me, looking back, it really was a case of demonstrating what could be done. And first of all, it was really was very simple Excel data link dashboards showing uh, asset managers uh, what could be what was happening now as opposed to wait until nine o'clock the next morning. Um, very, very basic, but for some people, this was a huge step forward. It was a huge step forward for us all, to be honest. But then as we started you know, rolling those out, those small uh, Excel-based dashboards, the pool in the business really started to increase. And then the question was, what else could be done? Can you help me with this problem or that problem? And it was great for me, but I could see the IS folks were starting to panic because I was uh, relying on them and pushing on them quite a lot. But then after the Excel dashboards, there were other issues that were uh, reading their heads in the business. And then, you know, we spoke about their uh, Excel as we moved into the Pi Vision space, which I hopefully we'll, we'll talk about soon, was there are other ways that we were um, um, designing or showing our story in one uh, specific area, which then could be translated into Pi Vision. And I think it was it's almost bird, uh, using that storyboard concept to show what can be done in one space and showing the story and the links between the data and the images and the KPIs, etc. Okay, good. Now, if, um, what comes next is something you've described a couple of times. There was a, a visit uh, from OSI Soft, and I know Russell, you're familiar with when we do customer visits like this. Can you kind of can you describe what the goal is? What what type of visit it is? What a goal is? What what just basically, what's the deal with that type of visit? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, so we, as you say, we do a lot of these kind of visits, sort of um, exploratory sessions with customers, exactly like uh, Glenn. You know, a lot of times customers have known the Pi system for a long time. They've known it as a historian. They're used to collecting data with it, and they're used to doing what they've been doing with it for a while. Um, but the reality is, is that 
an awful lot has changed. There's an awful lot of new things that you can do with the Pi system. Um, fantastic analytics, decision support, uh, event-based surveillance, lots of new stuff that in many cases people ha either haven't seen or they're not aware of or are aware of but might not be aware that this is the stuff that they can do with technology they already have, like the Pi system. So we come in, um, we spend a lot of time listening to the customer, talking to the customer. I think the stuff that Glenn mentioned is, is critical. If the, the operations teams, you know, need to have a clear view of what they're trying to achieve. And, and we try and sort of basically explain to them and show them how the Pi system can help them achieve that and hopefully give them some inspiration of setting out on a on a new journey with, with doing more stuff with Pi, which is, I think, exactly what Glenn's been doing so well over the last couple of years. Yeah. So now, Glenn, what did you see that really impressed you or that, that you thought this would be a good idea to make some changes? So I, th I think that visit was really important. So uh, Keith Alderton and, and Mike Horrocks uh, came to came to our office, and uh, I think Keith in particular has uh, turned into a really important figure for me, m almost a, a mentor at times, and I think I've been a tormentor for, uh, him because I ask him a lot of questions. But the, the, the visit itself was uh, the first time I'd seen Pi Vision and AF, and there really was one one which was lots of information and loads of data in that um, in, in presentations and, and screens in that meeting. But it really was that simple spark line or, or small trend that really set me off. It was a unique moment for me because my mind was racing because I've had the experience previously working in operations and commissioning and then control room environment, production engineering, things I've been working in previously. But it was almost, what could I do with this now? You know, what sort of problems could, could, I, could I fix? Um, and the, again, it just—it was so exciting. I just, yeah, mind was really was racing. And again, it really was that eureka moment. But again, what was really important for me was Keith and Mike. And you know, I spoke about Mike uh, Keith earlier. I think Mike is a really important figure as well. And despite the football team he, he supports in the UK, but he's been a, a great <laughs> friend as well, really helping us along in the, on the journey. But Keith and Mike have never been prescriptive. They've never told us this is what you need to do. This is how you do it. It's what they really have pushed has been a, almost a, the natural evolution. You know, if you build it, they will come. Give us an idea of what can be done and let your mind uh, go racing and build the tools you need to build. And I think for, for us, that that uh, idea of not being uh, so prescriptive really worked well. Okay. So you mentioned this little trend. What was it about it that made you, uh, that made you think this was your eureka moment? What I was getting at, you know, you could have a lot of those on a screen. So if I, you know, if I have a simple PFD, if I'm looking at um, uh, uh, an oil platform that's flowing to, to, you know, elsewhere, there are loads of different points in there that I'm looking at, you know, single data points. But previously I would have the number and I'd see that number changing. But then if I have a small thread next to it, I can start building a, a clearer view of actually of what asset performance is, is uh, taking place. Cool. I, I think you're never going to stop engineers, Nick, uh, liking to see lots of trends on a screen. Uh, you know, I see so many customers every week who build these massive screens with lots of trends. It's just, I think it's part of it. But I think also Glenn obviously makes a fantastic point here, which is sometimes it can be really simple uh, or what appears to us as, you know, technology people, really simple sort of changes that actually can make a massive difference to the way people operate. And I think, you know, we, we often get, carried away with technology or thinking or, you know, having ideas of where people want to be. And, and it's always so important to spend time with operations, people listening and understanding what they really do want and what really will help them, um, you know, improve what they're doing with data day to day. So I think it's a great story. Well, one more thing, I guess about the, you, when you had the visit, you said you saw AF for the first time. AF is asset framework. So if you're not familiar with that, it's a tree structure. What was it about the ability to put things in a tree structure that, that got you excited about it? Uh, so I think, if I'm told, it was the, the Pi Vision itself was the part that excited me. AF was almost the, the afterthought. But after seeing AF, the key part for me there was the scalability. You know, instead of looking at a niche solution for one particular piece of kit or, you know, any part of the process, the ability to take that, take what's been built in that one space and then scaling up across uh, the, uh, you know, the wider assets or across the business is, 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 is the part for me. It's, and I think that's one of the, we've had a number of workshops last year with our uh, process engineering team. And one of my key messages was that, you know, instead of looking at a, a single solution for one particular point of, a, of an asset, you know, think, think larger, you know, look at scaling up, you know, it, it's a few clicks of a button to go from one transmitter of one kind to a hundred of the same kind. And it's it's just getting that mindset over that if we need to scale up, it's easier to do. And I think um, AF allows us to do that a lot easier. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Um...
Yeah, so can you describe some of the things that you decided to do kind of based on what you saw in the visit? Uh, so I think for me, we, we knew we wanted to go somewhere, but we didn't know what. So uh, fortunately enough, I had an asset manager at the time who approached me with an issue, uh, a problem statement, if you will, you know, going back to what we said earlier. And they needed to see a certain data set or a few certain data sets at any given time to understand us performance in their space. So we then took uh, that problem statement and that's when we really started mocking up uh, the uh, the Excel and, and PowerPoint storyboard. Then there's other things as well, you know, certain boxes on a page affect the KPI tiles, colour changes, what did that colour change mean? Um, the KPIs themselves, there would be a number there. What would that number mean and what does the change in number mean? So for me, it was that first uh, product we actually delivered uh, after the storyboards, there was a lot happening on the page, but there was a lot happening if you understood all the context behind it, you know, for certain audience production or uh, production optimization folks, we'd understand there's a lot of information there. How is, you know, someone who isn't in the production what production optimization space could understand, okay, that's red, there's an issue there and, and maybe flag it up. And I think it's it's understanding trying to get across there that, you know, there's a lot of different messages that we can give across it on the one page, but, you know, not all users need to understand all the functionality to to understand there's a message uh, in there. But I think from that, what we did, we, we went for a really an 80-20 vision or an MVP, you know, the minimum viable product. We want to get something out into the business quickly so that then it could be used. And then we really kept that, you know, that that process up and, and, we, and we kept delivering at pace with the 80-20 model. So if we had that 80-20 vision, we would never get bogged down in aiming for that gold-plated standard that could may take many months. The key was to show, you know, different, you know, con continual uh, develop, delivery of different iterations of a product. And I think that works really well. If you deliver a product to someone and it's not really been clearly defined or there's no problem statement there the question will be from 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 your audience so what so what what, what does it actually mean how's this all actually impacting my day to day and i think that's a key part of my role is to try and deliver products to the business that will have an impact uh, on their role and a, a positive impact in the business and i think that's what we tried to do here we were we were taking problem statements what do people need to see okay give us give us your problem statement and then deliver a product on the back of that obviously with the uh, correct state code of engagement uh, throughout the throughout the journey, but just delivering something, you know, get out there rapid, and people can understand as that you know these things could be you know either resolved or you can get early indication of a, an issue occurring. Okay, were there any uh, uh, misconceptions that you had to kind of you know defeat? Lots, lots. How long have you got? I think for me, mimicking of DCS, mim mimicking the DCS screens was a, was a huge one, and I think that's something that. You speak to anyone in this space, you know, you know, peers, other operators. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge. And I think, you know, ten years ago, all the screens that were built in Pi, well, not all of them, but a number of them, were based on what the control room operators saw. And then for me, the, the question is, is that really what our uh, surveillance engineers on shore need to see? And, and my answer is always no. Okay, so, so people were just assuming that that's the whole purpose of Pi was just as a DCS mimic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, and why would a why would a production engineer need to see um, the what the the control room engineer uh, control room teams need to see? They're two different audiences. So that was you know that was one of our biggest issues, and we think we've we've moved away from that now. And um, the company mindset on Pi, it was a tool, and I think what we've seen there's a number of tools that we've got uh, over the past few years that we're not actually using. So you know, let's let's look at what we can use. Can we use it better as opposed to p pulling in something something new? And I think we, we've we managed to change the mindset there on Pi. There's that fear of technology, but again, it goes back to that point and uh, showing the people, this is how, it, you know, how do you um, um, actually uh, use a tool to, to help with your day-to-day -day job? Okay, so what kind of results have you gotten? A, lot, a, diff, a number of different kinds. So first of all, we had a little bit of pushback for some parts of the business, which is normal. But I think it was showing what the key wins actually were. So first of all, we saw a 20% uh, increase in production in one field. And I think the, the reason for that was we had a clearer view of, of the data, you know, all the process and the parameters itself. It also allowed us to determine what the maximum production potential for one particular asset actually was. There was lots of good area there previously, but what we've we then had was a clear view of what the data was and, and show it, demonstrate what the, what the maximum potential was. But I think one of the biggest wins for me was it allowed us to uh, be satisfied that people were looking at the same data. I spoke about 
Excel before. You know, you can have one engineer develops a, a tool in Excel and it's in their folder or their desktop, and you have another engineer who can develop another tool in Excel and it's in their folder. And there's no, there's no, you know, link between the two. There's no silos. But what we, I think, we've we've attempted to do is, you know, drive some standardization across the different assets and and remove those silos. So when you know person A in one in one asset be onshore or offshore is speaking to person B, they know that they're looking at the same data and the same uh, same information. Right, right. So, and you won an award. Can you describe that? Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. So that was. Uh, I think we're really lucky. Um, uh, during uh, COVID, uh, we won a, a national data IQ award uh, for machine learning. So it's part of our. Uh, my uh, boss, my current boss, arrived in the business 2019, and he was really pushing for you know improvements to be made in Pi, which that that did happen. But the key part was. There was stuff that we could do in Pi, and we were understanding what was happening yesterday and why an incident had happened. But it was a real push to understand what was going to happen tomorrow, today. So I think early 2019, some conversations began with a data science company who then uh, came into our business and had a chat with us. They gave us a few examples of work that they've done previously. And to be honest, I think it was six or seven they showed number of them just you know weren't relevant to us but there were two in particular that we thought you know we could we could we could progress conversations started and in, 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 you know increasing over a period of time but what we then did again goes back to the problem statement we had to look at our own data and understanding where could we best use data science so we had a, a view of there were a number of different issues and one asset in particular and we um, sat down with the data science company and we uh, built a, a well-defined problem statement and then uh, from there uh, over a period of a few months, uh, they took a lot of our real-time data. They started building a model, and um, what the the aim of the model was for us to have um, indication of a trip occurring. So previously, this trip would occur, and prior to occurring, the the controlling team would have five minutes pre-warning. And you know, it's it's pandemonium as they're making changes to 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 the parameters there. Our aim was to give them 15 minutes warning, um, and it to be 50% um, uh, accurate. When the data was finally delivered, what we found was that the the, the time allowed uh, for for that pre-warning, for the early warning, was anything from 15 minutes up to three hours. You know that a trip was was going to occur. But what it also did was uh, we, the accuracy of the model was a lot better than expected. I think we got up to around 80% accuracy in the model. Uh, and yeah, we, we we were shortlisted for an award, which was exciting enough uh, for myself uh, last year. But uh, we ended up winning, in which which came as a huge shock. But I think for me is this uh, award or this, you know, this model would never have been avail uh, achievable without, you know, all the different people in the business, be it IS, be it our operations function, our operations teams in the asset, our production engineers. It's just, yeah, you say I won an award, but for me, you know, the whole team won the award. Right. What it also did is the model itself, it, it shaped our learning a little bit. It almost gave us a that uh, adrenaline injection to try and push into that uh, predictive space. And I think that's then shaped a lot of the work that we're doing in 2021 uh, with, with Pi. What we're trying to do is um, we understand if an issue has happened, and you know, for root cause analysis, but I think the key value is understanding that something is going to happen so that you can then take corrective action. Okay. So you, you I'm sorry, go ahead, Russell. No, sorry, Nick. I was just going to dive in with a quick question, actually, Glenn. So, I mean, the story is fantastic. And I think for me, what really resonates with the spirit story is that you've really focused on getting your foundations right first, doing as much as you could in the Pi system in your data layer. And then you started building those sophisticated projects and programs and, and you started winning awards on, on, on top of it. Um, I guess we, we've talked a lot about this before in the past, Glenn, but there's, there's a lot of companies out there who are sort of maybe telling a different story, right? There's a lot of software vendors are coming into the industrial space and they're sort of they're trying to push technology like Pi back into the kind of historian space and just say, oh, we just need data from these things and you know, we've got the silver bullet, we've got all these tools that, that they can be whether whether we're talking digital twin or stuff in the cloud or analytics just for the sake of analytics. You know, I think all this stuff has tremendous value and a role to play. Um, but maybe none of it on its own is 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 the, is the single silver bullet. What's what's your thoughts on that? And, and and out of all that sort of stuff that's floating around, what, what what do you think is is the hot stuff that you're really interested about to put on top of Pi? And maybe what is the stuff that you you, you think isn't getting it quite right? So I think, as you probably know, I've got a few thoughts in this space, Russell. So first of all, is the uh, is the um, is the silver bullet? So I think if it existed, we'd all be using it. Pharma, food production, energy industry manufacturing we don't if there's a tool out there that could do this we'd all be using it and there would be no need to have all these different competitors in the market so for me it's 
it's what tool out there can actually help the people that we're employed to do the job that we've employed them to do. We talk about digital twin as if, as if it's a relatively new term, but as you know yourself, Russell, models have been around for a long time. And, I, you know, it's maybe it's a, a, a different way of looking at the models that we all use, you know, well modeling, et cetera, you know, reservoir modeling. Um, digital transformation though is key for me. It really interests me. Uh, I like to get involved in that space. And I think there are countless areas where we could use digital tools to help our business. But going back to something I've said earlier a few times, again, it's a problem statement. You know, unless you have a, a problem statement uh, for a particular product, then you run the very real risk of um, creating tools for no particular reason. And again, it's technology for the sake of technology. And I think it's it's almost a Wi-Fi fridge. And for me, we want to deliver products that allow our people to get to that decision point a lot quicker. And I think that's when we spoke about Pi data link earlier, people are pulling in data into one space. And then we talk about Pi vision or, and, and you know whatever else, you know, your historian or you know however you're visualizing your data. The key part for me is get allowing your people to get to that decision point a lot quicker. The real key focus should be improving the competence and skill set of our own engineers. You know, we allow them, we employ them to be engineers, but a lot of the time they're 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 collating data, they're cleansing data. But if you give them that data, it's already cleansed, allows them to get decision points. Then if you give them some extra tools on top of that, allow to get insights from that data. And again, going back to what I said earlier, try to identify what's going to happen tomorrow, today. And I think that's that's that should be the goal for 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 a lot of us. I wanted to ask you, um Glenn, you know, on this journey um, you're going to have had a whole range of different stakeholders and people with different opinions and perceptions of things. Can you say a little bit about stakeholder buy-in? How did you how did you sell the the vision that you had and that light bulb uh, that light bulb moment to the entire Spare Energy organisation to get behind you and and and, and achieve what you've done? I, I think in our business it was about engaging with key stakeholders, speaking to people really, <laughs> and but on also on that it was also about showing them what what had been done and what could be done so showing them what had been done you know what business issue had we resolved and again it goes back to what you you said there that then then having that eureka moment themselves the light bulb and thinking okay you've you've developed a solution for you know problem x could i do something similar for 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 this for this problem and for me that's if i hear someone saying that i love it because i know they're there off on that journey and that's what i really want that's what i really want to see but it's also letting people know that this it's not some sort of flash in the pan initiative that's going to be gone you know we're rolling something out you know 2017 it'll be forgotten about in 2018 it's letting them know that it's not going to go away and the way i see it is i see ourselves building a digital toolkit for our, for our people you know a digital a set of digital tools that our people can use in the day-to-day -day. what i've also found is externally is, is when i've been talking to other operators you know we've, we've got a good relationship with a number of the other operators in aberdeen quite an open uh, and an honest uh, uh, relationship is um we've shared a lot of what we've done and it's um, and it's not just peers in Aberdeen, but peers in in like say uh, uh, Ireland who you know get involved in some of our forum discussions, and we formed a we formed an optimization forum a couple of years back, which really is working well. And there's lots of people asking you know questions in there, and you can see the different journey all the other operators are on at the same time. But one of the key parts for me is we're good at sharing success stories. We can say this is a, this is what we've done, this is what we've done. But one of the key parts for me is also sharing the failures because. Yeah, we've spoken about Eureka moment and someone can rush off and, you know, develop their own tool. But if we share a, a problem we've had or a failure, because it's all about failing quick. You know, if we fail quick, that's a success in itself. But if we share those failures, we're helping ensure that someone else doesn't spend a lot of time and resource going down a rapid hole that's not going to actually provide any value to them in the long term. Right. And I, and I guess in, in, in almost all cases, this is technology that people already have. So I, I suppose if, if operations teams recognize that they're going to be close to the work that's done, it's their ideas, they're doing the configurations of the system, they're able to quickly build the solutions they need. Um, you get a lot of buy-in at that point, right? There's, these aren't the kind of IT projects where someone's coming along and saying, write us a massive check and IT will go away for six months and then they'll come back and do something. These kind of initiatives with the Pi system are, are kind of very different, right? Yeah, but I think it, it, what you just said, they're your engineers. You know, no one knows our issues better than th than our own engineers. It's not people in IS and the greatest respect to Ozisoft. It's not Ozisoft. Our own people understand our, our problems uh, uh, more than anyone. But what you know, Ozisoft, uh, re some real time data tools do is allow them to get insights into the issues they've got. And I think that's that's a key success for me. It's um, showing them what can be done in a particular space and improving their skill set and their competency, so they can then run off and develop products that we haven't thought about yet you know and we've we've seen great success with one of our um, rotating equipment engineers uh, over the past couple of years we showed him uh, what could be done you know back in 20 
18 or so and he's really taken it on himself and he's went on a fantastic journey uh, with some of the stuff he's done in rotating space which just blows me away and it but for me it's it's so great to see that that someone's taken that sort of eureka moment and just run with it okay. hey one thing uh we when we were talking about af i forgot to ask you what kind of things you're doing you're actually doing to help people scale up and you know to just get good use of af what kind of things are you doing that really exploits the the value of af doing that kind of stuff so if you go back to 2018, we, we or 20, uh, all the year, based on the last year, they all blend into one, I suppose. Uh, now I've <laughs> lost track. But I think in 2018, 2019, we, uh, we followed up from our Pi project, initial Pi project for one of the assets and started delivering a, um, a standardized landscape for, 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 for the business. And uh, we, we focused on a few different areas. And those were really initially were the wells. So we, what we saw is some areas of the business we'd have a, a view for some points in a well. They then have different screens are looking at wells. So there's no no standardised view. So if one of our production engineers was one in one asset, and they then had to go look in another asset's well stock, the views were different. And you know we're same company that should happen. So what AF helped us to do was build a standardised uh, view for for a well surveillance. So there was a instead of having all those you know. 20 different views of, of the wells. We had a standardised uh, spirit energy view where, with a, a drop-down selector would allow us to you know, go to any well in the business and all the well, all the views would look the same. But it wasn't just a surveillance uh, view, it was, almost, it was always uh, well integrity also because with the well stocks there, AF allowed us to build that you know, scalable view of well integrity uh, uh, surveillance for the well integrity folks as well. But then it's moving into uh, this year, we've got quite a lot of projects that we're working on, we've identified for 2021. And, and for me, it's scalability is the key message there. So we've identified you know, one or two issues back end of 2020, which uh, resulted in some issues for ourselves. But for me, it's, uh, for me and the team, it's a case of to identify what the issue is, create the solution and then identify similar tags or transmitters or assets of a similar type and then scaling it up across across the business. Okay. You made a, a kind of a clear delineation between what you were doing, what IS team was doing, and you came up with some recommendations on how to how to make that work well. Can you describe that? Yeah, it worked well for me. I don't know if it'll work well for anyone else, but you know, I can share my 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 uh, my experience. And it's really simple. You know, I've sat uh, with other uh, other companies and given them my my Barcelona presentation, and the room was full of IS people. And I had to be honest. You know, they they are key to delivery. They're a key stakeholder, and one of the most important stakeholders in delivery of any product. But the business, they are not the business owner. The business owner is your operations teams, <coughs> your production teams, your maintenance teams. These are the people that would use it. I mean, I'm not a huge car racing fan or a motorcycling fan, but the driver in those areas is critical for the tools that has been developed. And the, the driver is the person you'll ask for feedback on a particular tool. And in this space, the, our production engineers, our operations people, our maintenance teams, you know, all those people that are using the digital tools are your drivers, not the people who are actually uh, delivering the, the, the tool itself. So one of the things I, I kind of glossed over it, I really forgot to even prepare a question for you about it, but I thought it was fascinating that you described how after you did a presentation in 2018 in, at, at our conference in Barcelona, uh, you kind of took that on the road. There, it was, there was some interest. Is that a good way to try to go and get buy-in all, all around? I think, you know, we're, we, we don't need buy-in from other operators, you know, from a project we're, we're doing. But what we are comfortable doing is sharing uh, the journey we've went on and the projects we've, we've, we've embarked on. And I think, you know, there are successes in those projects, but again, there's also some failures. And, um, but again, for me, you know, if you fail fast, that's not a failure, that's a success in itself. So as Russell knows, you know, we had um, a couple of operators in Aberdeen uh, ask me to, you know, if I'd spare an hour or so and go and present the same Barcelona presentation to, to themselves. And again, it was really interesting because in, in a couple of those meetings, uh, there were, you know, a couple of management personnel, but really IS heavy. And, you know, you could you could see the room change a little bit. The temperature almost changed a little when I when I questioned why IS were there. And for me, it's IS are a key stakeholder. Again, I said in the previous answer, but they're not the business owner. The business owner is you know, our operations and, and production teams. And for me, that's I could share as many screens as I wanted, but that was the key message I needed to get across. And you know, people. I think people think they'll see a screen and think they're going to copy it. And that's, and that's fine. You know, if people want to do that. But what's more interesting for me is people take that again as the eureka moment I had with the, with the presentation with Keith and Mike a few years back and then went into their own tool set. I mean, I've seen some of the, um, 
I don't want to name the, the operator, but um, if they're watching this, I'll know who they are. But a recent forum, they shared some of the work they've done uh, on equipment health monitoring, and I was blown away. And they mentioned the Barcelona presentation, but they've taken one particular uh, area we worked on, and they've just run away with it. And I, I just thought it was a phenomenal piece of work, it really was. Yeah. I mean, I th and, and, um, Nick, if I can add to that, I mean, I think it's super important. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of operations guys will be bombarded with IT software companies and vendors coming in, talking to them, you know, all day. And um, it's so powerful when you have an operations guy for one company going into another company and saying, look, this is what we've achieved with this kind of technology that you already have. Let me help you, show you, guide you. I mean, we are massively grateful to Glenn, and, and, and I think it's a fantastic initiative. And we've got so many operators up in Aberdeen um, that have got value from this, and I, and I hope we're going to do more of it. I hope I'm going to be able to persuade Glenn that we should be doing more of it, because I think there's a lot more opportunity for a lot more people to go on this same journey that, that Spirit have gone on with their Pi technology. So I'll give you a prime example. We had an invite uh, last week for the next. We, we, we sort of rotate the ownership of the, the forum itself, the hosting. And we had the invite through last week for the next one. And one of the agenda items there is pie trips and ticks, uh, tips and tricks. People want to know what's happening. You know, they want to know what other people are doing. And it's just showing what, what actually can be done with the tool. So then they can have their Eureka moment and run off and develop their own stuff. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Giving people the right tool, giving people a tool that's easy to use and they can do it, uh, has just amazing, amazing results. Actually, one of the things I wanted to ask you later on is see if there were any un, uh, surprising results, but I don't want to spring that on you. What I do, though, that's it. That's all, that's all our time for today. I did want to ask you, our, 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 what do we call them? I'm sorry. <laughs> lightning round questions. Yes, our lightning round questions. Thank you very much. Not too quick on the feet this morning. You know, it's 6 a.m. here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, never mind. But uh, okay with you, Glenn, if I, uh, if I shoot some questions at you that uh, are near and dear to the folks in operations? Yeah, as long as it's not about Super Bowl on Sunday when the Chiefs lost, I'm, I'm happy to answer it. <laughs> okay. So you, you're working, where are you, downtown or you're at a production site or where are you? So I'm, I'm working remotely. I'm working from home. Um, oh, my normal day-to-day -day, um, uh, before, before the pandemic, I was uh, based in the Aberdeen office, but I'd regularly visit our uh, sites uh, in East Ida Sea, uh, okay. Barrow, or um, Netherlands, our office in Netherlands, and uh, our office in Norway. And I think, you know, um, the Norway office in particular, there's been a, a big, uh, uh, not a change there, but um, sort of showing them that what the likes of Pi can do in, in their reception to it has been has been fantastic and uh, you know had a uh, a meeting with one of them last week in regards to real time data and you know some other tools that can be plugged on the top of of pi uh, that can help uh, improve them on their day to day and yeah it's just for me it's it's really good seeing that again it's that change in mindset change in behavior and just seeing people you know seeing a tool that can be used to help them in their day to day okay but over your career you've been you've worked in operations you worked at production sites a lot right mm -hmm. so um, do you have a a piece of memorabilia from like a blown out valve or a, a burned circuit board that you keep on your desk like many engineers no i don't actually i think um most of that if anything does go wrong it's normally uh carried away for some sort of investigation so i never managed to get my hands on anything like that and i, I don't think I'd, I'd like to i think it would bring back uh, bad memories so no not at the moment okay so what's the coolest calculation or code that you've ever written <laughs> I have no idea. As I said, I'm not. I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, code and uh, calculations, um, I effectively steal with pride and just see what I can do uh, elsewhere. So it's um, yeah, okay. steal with pride. Okay, cool. So what's the typical animal that that wanders onto your site? I guess in a, offshore, there's nothing that wanders onto site. So, but you should say that. So I've seen. Uh, I've seen a few. I've seen uh, a sunfish when I'm offshore. We used to see. Uh, uh, schools of whales, or you know, uh, you know those sort of things. But um, lots of birds, and um, yeah, I've seen. Uh, I got a nickname. I shouldn't be saying this actually, but I got nicknamed for a uh, one trip. Uh, there's a, a very famous uh, uh, 60s movie, I think it is in the UK, called Kez. It's about a boy who develops a, a friendship with with a with a bird. And um, I was being uh, unbeknown to me, the few uh, guys were uh, hiding on a corner. And when I w walked towards a wellhead, uh, there was a, a bird that they'd conveniently placed there, which just jumped out and uh, uh, terrified the life out of me. So, yeah, for the, the duration of that trip, my name was Kez. <laughs> you know, that's that's a question I keep wanting to ask, but I think 
I think it would just be too inappropriate is is what are some of the four more interesting nicknames because you know they're all over operations but you don't want to know you don't want to know that's right yes <laughs> you don't want to well, know. well any are there any surprise one of the things that Pat Kennedy our founder really likes to talk about is when people all of a sudden they have visibility into the, their sensor based data they never had before and all of a sudden somebody who's like you know, they're responsible for reordering something who's in a completely different department. All of a sudden they do things that that, you know, saves a tremendous amount of money, just completely unforeseen because they have new visibility. Have you had anything like that just absolutely fall into your lap, completely unintended? I think when we uh, the storyboard uh, concept we spoke above was to build a dashboard for an asset with the KPIs, etc. And I remember one day one of the planners uh, popped their head in and said, uh, what does that mean when that that line's dropping? So they basically told us that the planet had, had tripped. We had we had no view. You know, we were all too busy working away and uh, looking at other stuff. But someone who isn't involved in that day to day um, sh let us know uh, what was happening. And for me, that's that's someone who's not in that space at all, just looking at visualization of data, understand there's an issue. There's an issue. Not doesn't need to know the the detailed understanding of what's actually happened, but flagging it up. And that for me is that's 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 the goal in itself. You don't need to be a domain expert to understand that you know there's an issue if you if you've seen a line dropping stick mm -hmm. your head in and, and tell people yeah I, I thought that was fantastic very cool well that's it that's all our time hey is there anything that uh, i wasn't smart enough to ask you that you'd like to i mean you know you you've done something that an awful lot of folks in engineering need to do uh, and and the funny thing is you weren't i i searched through your slide deck i don't think you used the word digital transformation once did you Hate it, hate it. I hate that term. I really do. I do, and I do. I, I do. I, I hate that term. And I, um, it's a term that we we all use. It's but for me, it's because when we talk digital tr transformation, people think of tools. They'll think of, and when I say tools, they'll think of you know iPads, tablets, you know, uh, augmented reality, all those things. And I think they've got their place. But how can you go so far in the future to you know all these weird and wonderful products when you can't even do the basics right? And I think for me, is it's. If you go and ask 10 different people what digital transformation actually is, you get 10 different answers in the business. But for me, it's if you look at, a, you know, for any sort of problem that an engineer has from zero to 100, you know, if that's a timeline, zero to, you know, they'll start to understand the problem. But they'll generally use the, the from uh, 20 up to 70, you know, uh, cleansing data, uh, publishing data, you know, manipulating data. For me, digital transformation is about accelerating that point to a decision uh, area. Give the engineers your data in a format that's already been cleansed, that's already been you know verified, that's available for them to arrive at the decision point. And for me, that's what digital transformation is all about. It's it's not about you know digital tools or you know that movie with Tom Cruise, you know the um, uh, what he's in the screen with the, yeah, yeah get from there. or even Tony Stark, you know when he's he's creating all those things, you know maybe 10, 20 years in the future. But let's do some simple stuff really well before we start doing the really funky stuff. Okay, cool. So any uh, any advice you'd have for somebody who's uh, who's kind of at the position you were, you know, in 2017? I think um, it's find someone, find someone in your business who's got an interest in this space. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've got an interest because my my previous work in life, I've been using, you know, uh, DCS or ICSS systems and, and Pi. Find someone with an interest. But most importantly, don't create technology for the sake of creating technology. Find out what your problem is. Get a problem statement and then build something on the back of that solve that problem and then things will um move uh, or evolve naturally as opposed to forcing some sort of digital landscape on a on a on a, a group of people okay great great well thank you so much we've been talking to glenn milne again glenn is i've forgotten your title glenn you're the uh, uh production systems manager at spirit energy thank you so much for joining us glenn thank you very much for having me nick it's been a pleasure thank you, thank you. and thank you russell for being our co-host Thanks, Nick. My pleasure. And uh, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Nick. All right. We'll see you all next week or in two weeks. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye.